Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of The Orthodox Nationalist. Today we're going to deal with um, with something more fundamental. Um, we're seeing the system go a little bonkers as it's you know, banning Alex Jones and, and everything else. Now let's, let's get something straight here. Our vocabulary for describing this sort of thing uh, using terms like censorship and everything else is, is problematic only because it refers to state action. Now, the men who wrote the American Constitution could not envisage a society of these global massive media corporations that control opinion. Not just control opinion, control the foundation of opinion. Uh, the power they have is far greater than any government ever could, uh, ever could hope for. A uh, captain of industry is far more powerful than any Roman emperor uh, could ever dream about. But the problem is, these companies are, are obviously far more powerful than the state. The state is dependent on them to function. The state has to go to private banks to function. Um, and yet, not only are they not controlled by the Constitution, they're protected by it. Showing how irrelevant uh, the document is. Because the world of the Constitution uh, in the late 18th century no longer exists, unfortunately. Uh, concepts like law and representation don't have the same meaning today as they did back then. But what's happening here? Uh, why is the regime, uh, the ruling class, the way it is? Now, when I refer to the ruling class, I'm talking about that collection of people you might see at um, the Bilderberg conferences. Uh Elites in academia, in industry, in media, in government, military, um, and all these hybrid public-private institutions, the military being one of them. Um, and they get together informally to coordinate policy. Um, the fact that all of these media companies banned Infowars and, and, of course, a bunch of other smaller institutions at the same time, proves collusion and proves that um, um, right, in term for, right in time for the midterm elections <clears throat> proves that um, um, that there is no competition. There is a, an elite ruling class um, that has monopolized all property. Uh, productive capital is owned by a tiny handful of people, including all stock and debt, while the bottom 50% of the population own absolutely nothing because their debt is far higher than their assets. Uh, so it's a far worse proletarian than even Karl Marx could have uh, could have pictured. Now one of the root, if I use a term like no world order, which I use, um, first used by George Bush in the late 80s, uh, refers to the ascendancy of this class to total global dominance. And the weapon that they use is free trade. Um, free trade is not merely this hypothetical ideal of governments or, or, or corporations within states trading among themselves with no barriers of any kind. In other words, no state can permit any policy increasing the price of foreign goods artificially. Um, it's an entire mentality. It's a cosmopolitan, uh, very Judaic view of the world. It's very materialistic, and it inverts the natural order by putting the mercantile concern, which is always the lowest concern in all traditional societies, at the very top. The ultimate demonic delusion is that money can buy everything. That's strictly a fantasy that people have. People with money are particularly happy and don't get what they want, but they'll destroy people in, in the pursuit of it. I always laugh when I think of the lottery winners or uh, newly minted celebrities who are given huge checks only to completely destroy themselves. Something happens to them when they're given really the only thing that this society values, and that's money. They completely check out of the real world. Speaking of money, um, I need your help. Um, I do this full time. Summer's a rough time for me. Um, I'm sending my USSR book as a gift to all my donors, at least my larger donors. 
to help keep me on the air. I do this full time. This is not a, a, a time for, for part timers. We have to be keeping up, uh, at this stuff 24 seven as I've been doing for almost 30 years. And I continue to go, I ask you to go to my website, um, rushjournal.org and use a donation button to help me out. And every penny goes to either my own debt service, which is unfortunately I have a debt to the IRS for some reason, among other things, and to the expenses of living this kind of a life, uh, which is extremely difficult. Anyway, capital's immense mobility, you know, and tremendous resources have left the state pretty much helpless. And capital is searching for low labor costs with high productivity, and free trade suggests that they'll flee nations with high labor costs. This also implies that nations will have to ensure that both labor costs are low domestically and guarantee that labor will be docile. So markets clearly don't serve the interests of labor. And it's worse when capital gives bonuses to executives that slash labor costs. Governments don't exist in any normal sense of the term. It's, it's largely an illusion. Governments are spokesmen for private capital. They usually are from capitalist enterprises. Those who serve under them are usually almost exclusively from capitalist enterprises. And that's the only interest that they serve. Money is the illusion of possession, of having, of having power, of having class, of having knowledge. It's the, it's the fallacy of an argument from authority that you have money, therefore you should be, uh, an important person. Um, politicians, remember, you know, this is not what I'm referring to by the state. Politicians have very little power. Politicians have very little knowledge. Um, politicians don't implement law. I mean, certainly judges have power. And the way that their influence is, is hasn't really been fully understood yet. But um, politicians are used when things go bad in the economy, or when private actors um, make bad investments, they blame politicians. But somehow politicians, especially presidents, control investment decisions. As many of you know, this has been a huge pet peeve of mine. People are so dumb. They honestly believe that presidents and politicians, A, have any power at all, and B, have so much power that they control, uh, that they control the investment decisions of private corporations. Remember too that most of the governments, uh, in the Western world are privatized. Many of the functions of, of, um, you know, dealing with, you know, complete bankruptcy and falling tax revenues, a, a collapsing economy, the only way the government can, can continue to function uh, is, well, two ways to constantly, you know, enshrine big banks as their rulers, taking out huge loans from them, and uh, privatizing their functions, uh, farming it out to uh, a private corporations. Um, Paul Kirk Roberts, who's one of my favorite writers these days, uh, says this about free trade. So you end up with a situation where labor that is not paid the value of its margin of product because of huge excess supplies of labor in these labor markets, China and India, for example, labor that's not paid the value of its margin of product is highly mobile. And then he says elsewhere, international trade theory concludes that countries can service huge debts simply by lowering domestic wages in order to pay creditors. This is a policy currently being applied to Greece and it has been the basis of the IMS structural adjustment or austerity program imposed on debtor countries, essentially a form of looting that turns over natu- national resources to foreign lenders. Remember, international institutions like the IMF are, again, also illusions. They're simply private banks. It's a consortium of banks that, you know, have a fancy name. They use politicians as cover, but they're the ones who make policy. Um, states don't coin their own money. So this money belongs to private actors and are then distributed to who they will. Um, there's several elements here. The capitalist governments have to listen primarily to the major corporations that finance. Labor costs are essential 
So the regulation of trade will have much to do with ensuring that wages remain fairly low and unions non-existent. Um, but pressures are growing for states like the US and the UK to regulate more strictly the trade each has with its major partners. An important regulation of trade for the UK, for example, would be to protect wage rates at home. But developing states have an incentive to completely, uh, to completely unregulate FDI or foreign direct investment because they're always seeking foreign capital and income. If a country is deeply in debt, low wages might be used as part of an austerity regime designed to make exploitation easier. In other words, whenever a, a country is in debt, um, it's the classic element of capitalism and free trade where costs are socialized and made public, and yet profits are privatized. So the debt is actually borne by taxpayers. The debt is borne by uh, companies being liquidated and sold off and whatever is left being absorbed by major banks. Um, making sure that states are simply irrelevant. States simply don't matter. That's why I reject the notion of the deep state, because it refers to governments as actual functioning entities. Now you have countries like Belarus, Russia, and China, just to name three, where the state continues to function as a dominant entity. And this is why they're far more just than the oligarchies in the West. Vladimir Putin personally is more popular and more powerful than the oligarchs in Russia. In China, the Communist Party, for you know, which is really a national socialist government, is more powerful than economic elites. I mean, they have to they have to take them into consideration, but they can dictate terms. I've spoken on this show, a General Park Chung Hee, who when he came to power in a military coup in South Korea, took the economic elites and threw them all in prison and said, I'll let you out as soon as you agree to play ball with me. And if you don't, your competition certainly will. And this is the path to successful development. Um, the book that I've, I've loved uh, for a long time, uh, Bad Samaritans, The Myth of Free Trade and the Secret History of Capitalism. This is extremely important in making sense of what is happening here. The, the fundamental economic realities, the rule of money that lies at the root of the insane behavior of the regime at any given moment. The regime and the ruling class are one and the same thing. It is not the government. The ruling class and the government can be very different from one another. Um, for example, in the Vietnam War, the ruling class was viciously opposed to the Vietnam War, yet the government was in favor of it. Uh, Nixon was, you know, outside of the, of the established order, despite being a congressman, with the hatred of the USSR. And today, with Donald Trump, who has been rendered completely impotent by the ruling class, you know, media, banks, corporations, boycotts, everything else, to the point where the presidency now is a, is a shell. Why is this happening? What is going on? Why is capital the way that it is? Well, the concept is the Washington Consensus. Not a whole lot of our people are skilled in international political economy. I did this in grad school until so it's coming out my ears. You can't make much sense out of what's going on today unless you understand the field. The Washington Consensus is this agreement amongst elites, um, so-called neocons, neolibs, liberals, conservatives, and the establishment form, both part, all parties agree the consensus includes low taxes, small states, political democracy, free trade, low inflation, small welfare states, and low interest rates. The author of this book, Matthias Chang, and, and, and many others, myself included, this is a recipe for disaster. It's a cynical ploy by Western businesses to render the third world unable to compete with Western sources of capital and technology. But of course, it's just as bad for the working classes at home. The rule of capital is what capitalism is. It's not the free market. The free market is, is a myth. Markets have very little to do with how economics, especially when it comes to energy prices. Um, these are powerful um, hybrid state private elites that make these decisions and agree in meetings. These aren't market prices. But Chang's book makes two general arguments. 
when the first world industrialized and became the scientific and technological nodal point of the world based on tariffs, mercantile policy. The devotion to free trade is largely a post-World War II phenomenon. And then second, the best way for the third world to industrialize is to follow the example of South Korea or Singapore. Strong states that keep out foreign competition while funneling funds to national infant industries, just like the West used to do. This is why I've spent so much time on this show dealing with third world national socialists, national socialists in, in smaller uh, countries like Greece or Belarus. Uh, the third world isn't just necessarily non-white people. It's smaller states, smaller societies, uh, poor people. The Western banking establishment is represent, represented in the IMF, and they spread misery and poverty throughout the globe by through usury. Well, since the 1960s, third world growth has slowed considerably from 4.1% on average to just over 1% today. But this understates the problem because these percentages don't take into consideration the massive amount of productive capacity added over and above the late 1960 level. Um, Mexico and the Ivory Coast, for example, are two examples where they adopted IMF methods and were plunged into poverty. On the other hand, Singapore and South Korea are two countries that rejected the IMF. The state serves as the economic actor by mobilizing domestic resources to channel into domestic industries. So the state has to intervene between the global stage and the national one, and also between the companies that produce things and the workers who work for them. These relationships have to be controlled in the early part of industrialization to permit the accumulation of capital that can be used later for social reform. So, Matthias Chang, the author of this book, holds that short-term gains, like increases in wages, should be sacrificed for long-term state goals. Now, in order for the Korean or Chinese model to work, um, any ethno-state that we may found, anything like this, a few things have to exist. There has to be a strong, streamlined, honest civil service. There has to be a judiciary that is actually independent. Um... There's no relationship between the size of the state and the economic growth. But the state has to be connected to the nation. Um, these are two different things. It's a common fallacy to believe that somehow nations refer to governments. Governments are easy to conceptualize. They're, they're quantitative. And simple minds can only see quantitative terms. Nations are cultural linguistic entities, religious entities. Germany, France, Russia, these are deeply, you know, cultural, religious societies going back to the Middle Ages. The state is a separate issue altogether. This is what's supposed to protect this nation. The fact that in the West, it's now, this is the handmaid of capital, is a perversion. The United States is different because the U.S. is not a nation. It's a collection of nations. Uh, the only thing that really can, can solve the problems in this country is for the collapse of the dollar, the collapse of the economy, and the breaking up of the U.S. into its constituent units, including the development of ethnostates in different parts of the, of the society. So you have a society like Zaire, for example, in Africa, where there was a, you know, the growth of state power, but all it meant was that the ruling elite, you know, sent their money into Swiss banks. There's no connection between nation and state because it really isn't a Zairean nation. So we've got to have a strong legal culture mixed with a strong nation and a nationalist approach to economic development. This is a recipe for success. So in states where corruption is endemic and elites serve themselves, no amount of free trade or protection is going to help them. Now when I say corrupt, I mean this. Corruption is defined as where... Um, referring to government, where states pursue their own ends without any respect to the nation. So they'll sell off their, sell their souls to, to capitalism for the sake of short-term gains. This is a definition of corruption. The truth is, is that tariffs are a good thing. Um, they're an easy source of revenue, easy to collect, and they permit infant industries to survive. Now, if a country were to 
cut off foreign competition, it wouldn't mean it wouldn't be a subsidy for local producers. It would mean a growth of local producers. That there would be, especially if there's money made available, um, local businessmen now can form these companies that ordinarily money would have gone to the West or their, their, their competition. It wouldn't simply be an oligarchy. It would be under the best of conditions anyway. It would encourage, encourage greater and greater uh, investment locally. And people often forget about that. Um, local local corruption. So you know, in Africa, for example, you abstract for the for the very low IQ and things like that. Um, African industry could never get off the ground because local consumption will go to foreign brands. Um, the destruction of local industry is a common consequence. The foreign direct investment, and hence, is destructive to local and state sovereignty. The Washington Consensus, remember, says that national sovereignty is an outdated concept. But the outrage here is that Western powers, Western liberal powers today, industrialize behind tariff walls, long before there's any advanced competition to contend with. So if that's true, how much more important are tariffs today, especially in the third world, in poor societies, Moldova, Ireland, etc.? The West prospered behind tariff walls, under mercantilist policies, which is the heart of European development, based entirely on tariffs. Yet today the IMF holds that tariffs will retard development. The only real purpose of the Washington Consensus is that liberal trade policies are the best ways for advanced corporate interests to take larger and larger shares of third world markets, as well as to preempt any serious competition from developing in the future, a local industry. The consensus exists only to serve the elite interests and is not a rational principle of development economics. Remember what academics are. You know, we have a, a higher education system in America where study after study shows that students not only are not, are, are not gaining in any kind of critical insight or knowledge, but in fact are um, retreating, that they're less critical than they were before. University professors, especially if they're white males, live in utter fear of their students. All it takes is one female student hiding behind anonymity to say that you did something to her and your career is over. You'll never have to give um, evidence. You'll never know who, she, who it is. That's how bad it is. Academics live in terror. They live in terror of going outside of the consensus. Um, these are well-subsidized people. Uh, universities are essentially experimental communities. They're utterly totalitarian. When I was in college in, in the 90s, it, it, it simply wasn't the same. Even there, you had a tight control over information, the very opposite of what a university was supposed to be. I was almost thrown out of the University of Hartford for passing out the spotlight. I was so naive, I thought that, you know, it would just spark debate. Little did I know, I ended up working there. Um, it's a very spoiled, very, very, you know, it's a hothouse environment. They only talk to each other. They know their opposition only in caricature. Groupthink is even a greater problem for them when they live in this kind of fear. In an article I just saw, as a liberal professor, I'm in fear of my students. What he really means is his non-white and female students. Um, the bad Samaritans are not just government officials or corporate elites, but um, academics who justify them. In development polemics, history is the issue, not theory. The problem with intellectuals in this field is that theory is placed above all else. Um, people like Matthias Chang are, are arguing that, that the third world should imitate the history of the developed world. Import substitution, erecting high tariff walls, and having the state intervene in nearly every aspect of the production process to ensure a lack of corruption of the nation's interests is being served. And the West did no different. China's doing the same. In Taiwan, we could go on. South Africa. And the South African case is such a sad one because under apartheid, black immigration to that country was out of control. 
Wages were so high. It showed how a handful of whites in a strange land are able to carve out a first world economy entirely in isolation. And yet black governments in places like Nigeria, a wash, I mean literally drowning in oil in some places, and diamonds and gold can't do anything. Yet low IQ is a problem. Intense corruption based around the fact that there are no that the states and nations have no connection with one another in Africa. And this would be the case whether there were Western colonial powers or not. These are going to be Western colonial powers or local colonial powers. You know, it wouldn't have made any difference. Um, you know, had the white man not come to North America, uh, you know, the Sioux Indians and the Iroquois would dominate their neighbors no differently than, than the white man did. So this isn't a, a blame a blame whitey thing whatsoever. But in the third world today, you have actual national socialist government functioning. They don't call themselves that, of course. National socialism is simply the combination of a strong state sector, a commitment to high labor productivity, high wages, unionization, or at the very least a state financed unionization. I mean, in you know, South Korea. Unions were given the same treatment as, as corporate elites were. Stick with me, don't strike, and you'll see your wages go through the roof, which is exactly what happened. There is a secret history of capitalism. It's based around the statist idea. They're, one of the most maddening things is to hear amateur political scientists talk about the differences between the state and private capital. They aren't different today. In fact, they were never different. It's a revolving door. Power is power. It doesn't make any difference whether they're in a government office or in a corporate office. They're, they're, those are very similar. Um, early capitalism polluted freely. They used child labor. They forced workers to work very long hours with no investment in health and safety. And it was only the monarchies of Russia and Germany that tried to put a stop to it. The West industrialized to the use of the most ruthless methods. And the way to industrialize, to, to gain this huge pile of ready capital, could only come from colonialism. The ideology, of course, comes from the Kabbalah, the notion that the external world is nothing but flux. The natural order isn't really a natural order at all. It's, it's, merely, it's nothing until the elite imposes its interest on it. Which is John Locke's idea, that the, the natural order is nothing, but ownership is granted to someone when they mix this dead matter with their own ideas. Now, of course, capitalism vehemently rejects that idea. Since the people who make things do not usually keep them. Um, ownership is really granted by connections, networking, and connections with, with credit institutions. The state has always been a central economic actor the development of international uh, industrial capitalism in the West. You have a period of time, 18th century, where you have a massive quantitative and qualitative jump. How, you know, the, the immense amounts of capital, surplus capital, to build factories and all the infrastructure necessary to maintain it had to come from somewhere. Colonialism is really the only thing that explains it. There was never any such thing as national capitalism. Capitalism has always been international. Because the resources to build these factories had to come from abroad. It could be silver from Argentina, uh, the slave trade, um, the domination of, of local markets. For the advanced world to advocate laissez-faire when such conditions were forcibly created and maintained by the state is just historical literacy, and it's economic warfare on the poor. No development exists without a state, and no state can function without a nation. Nations are customary families, speaking the same language in the very broad sense. They're outgrowths to the family. They've been through a lot together. By language, I'm referring to pretty much any sort of communication whatsoever. Uh, the, the universe of meaning that um, connects 
one person to another so that communication can exist. This has always been an enemy of the capitalist order. Capitalism has sought to isolate people, to destroy communities, because communities, when joined together, can be very strong. Capitalism has always been a revolutionary ideology no different than Marxism. Karl Marx was very clear about this. It destroyed the natural order. It reduced everything to money. The real issue here is the, the proper application of economic history to economic theory. And there was a time where Japanese and Germans were considered poor examples of economic actors and workers. It was just the right combination of things to set these two people to silence stereotypes and see the connection between personal self-interest and the lack of, of, of bureaucratic corruption. Bureaucratic efficiency and lack of corruption serves the personal interests of the state and the economy far better than the short-term root of corruption. Because corruption is always based on the short-term. Liberal democracy places short-term interests of politicians and elites and places them far ahead of anything else. The only thing that matters is long-term planning for the common good, which liberal democracy can't comprehend. Now let's understand something. Mass democracy is a myth. Politicians simply don't have power. I've mentioned before on this show that the origin of this goes back to the Medici family when they took over in Florence. Um, certainly the most economically powerful uh, society in Europe. And they ruled it as, as an oligarchy, but always behind the scenes. This is where Machiavelli got his ideas from. It was the Medici's that he, that he had in mind. They maintained the veneer of the old Republican system, but controlled it entirely from, uh, from behind the scenes. So politics became theater. It became sophistry. But if a strong state is central to economic growth, then a nation is, is necessary for a strong state. Strong states don't come out of nowhere. They have to be rooted in a specific group of people. And that people is a religious, ethnocultural uh, manifestation of the family. And they've existed as long as mankind has existed. Modern states, of course, is another matter. Those are fairly new. But nations, tribes, communities, these have always existed. And this is the foundation of, of not only nationalism, but any kind of social organization. Free trade, as Karl Marx and, and Vladimir Lenin have said many times, um, it's necessary to destroy this. Because any time you have an alternative source of loyalty to the corporate elite, whether it be media or consumption or anything else, uh, like from the, the religion or the family, it needs to be destroyed. It's another competitor. The modern state created the conditions of capitalism. Capitalism uh, didn't come into existence, you know, by itself. Industry required mass colonization for this huge influx of capital to build the to build the industrial enterprises. This is, um, you know, this is the nature of it. Uh, canals, um, electrification, research grants, everything else. This is absolutely essential for any kind of development. Now, free trade requires a, a so-called legal framework. Now, like everything else, this is an illusion. Institutions are fantasies, at least in our postmodern world. Institutions are images. Um, like the IMF presents itself as this objective international body, worrying about the balanced growth of, of, of the international economy, it's nothing more than a consortium of banks seeking profit. Now, today... This sort of thing is shown by something else. It might be an obscure issue, but the investor state dispute settlement system, ISDS, has become a, a, an area of contention. Um, this is a means put forward by both governments and international bodies 
to offer separate legal regimes for, invest- for, for investors to sue foreign states. So in Great Britain, uh, Peter Lilly um, has argued that this gives multinationals their own court system outside the normal legal channels of Britain, or anywhere else for that matter. And he says this, U.S. companies can sue the U.K. government should it want to take back to the public sector privately provided services in the NHS, for example, education or so forth, or open fewer services to private provision. The EU and UK government have denied this is possible. But a coach at council's opinion argues that because these tribunals can award unlimited fines, they could exert a chilling effect on government decision making. Generally, Western governments are weak by comparison to the banks, but they still can cause trouble. What I'm talking about here is a very powerful example of how irrelevant the state is. This legal scheme insulates capital from normal legal channels on the grounds that American or European capital fears the possibility of some sort of expropriation. The average case in this scheme is about $8 million, ensuring that it's not available to small business. Lilly's argument is that big business has such control over London politics that the present regime insists that normal laws and legal channels be discarded in favor of their own law. A realist can view this as a means of protecting companies that contribute to either the political or economic security of the state, even while taking a short-term loss or risking short-term economic revolt. But this complaint is a common one. And the ISDS is a major pillar in the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, or GTIP. And it's been rightly condemned, although often for the very wrong reasons, as a means whereby it elevates international capital to a legal status, equivalent to that of the state itself. They've simply outgrown the state. I mean, they've created it, but now they want to go beyond it. Um, The Australian government, for example, um, doesn't support provisions that would confer greater legal rights on foreign businesses than those available to domestic businesses. Uh, domestic actors. Not only would it, would it equalize these in Australia uh, and any other any other member of the of the TTP TTIP uh, institution, government support provisions that will constrain the ability of Australian governments to make law and social, economic, and economic matters in circumstances where those laws do not discriminate between domestic and foreign businesses. Um, I'm quoting from a from an Australian source. But the point is, when you have a situation where the treaties um, of a government have to be obeyed as if they were law, and then this law is created by international bodies, you are that much more removed from any kind of popular control. I mentioned the Medici family because it goes to the root of, of modern politics. The mass man doesn't know anything. He knows, if, has a few images in his mind, largely emotions, um, mixed up facts here and there. He simply doesn't have the time or the clarity of thought to study issues in depth. That's up to people like me. Amateurism is a problem in any field. You know, it's dangerous in medicine, it's dangerous in politics. And we're at a point now where the information in any particular field is so overwhelming that you really have to have specialists working full-time, in order for there to be any real critique of the system. TTIP is just an extreme example of this, where now it's not merely that capital has created the state, but now it's discarding the state. So on the one hand, governments might favor multinationals, so as to offer legal privileges. On the other hand, they might want to respond to the democratic demand for a single law for everyone. Investors don't. Now, the notions of law, single law for everyone, equality under the law, is again, these are images. These don't exist. Uh, Lawyers, judges, um, even juries who have no conception of of reasonable doubt are in control of this. Governments can act in their interests in either direction. Uh, They govern the force that that demands on any one side. Australia's ruling party responds to this favor. Uh, that to, this is a favor of one side, that of local control, since they're opposed to this, this institution. They exercise more power over them than these abstract legal demands of certain conglomerates. Conglomerates are treated as fictitious citizens. 
protected by the Constitution, even though they are of immense power. So if a business doesn't like what Australia or the Japanese government uh, does, it can take that to a higher body, sue them there, and that will then be imposed on the society. And this is why the TTIP had, had created such, such outrage. But of course, this is nothing new. The notion of um, now discarding the state entirely which is largely privatized to begin with, is is the next next phase in the New World Order. Um, today we know that there is a war between China and the USA for the status of reserve currency. It's the most dangerous issue in international politics and in American life. For the US to lose its role is to have the demand for dollars fall very sharply. And extreme inflation will be the result. The dollar is coercion. The dollar is backed up by the increasingly incompetent American military. Why is Russia under the gun? It's because they've already nationalized their central bank and are in the process of de-dollarizing um, their international purchases. And closely associated with this is the desire to achieve price stability. So price supports might be a way to even prices out over time, but actually they increase price instability. State intervention in trade domestically is the cause of price instability in the first place, he argues. It was argued by, by writers like uh, Devados in 1992. Um, making this part of international trade, especially from the dominant state, it just internationalizes the problem. So the notion of building a tariff wall around Russia or China is a way to insulate them from the insanity of uh, volatility from the West. Western governments have no money. Western governments have more debt than they could they could never repay it. There aren't, aren't enough dollars in the world to repay the trillions of dollars of debt both in the public and private sectors. The only way governments can function is that elite banks forward them cash. That means elite banks control the state. Look at the cabinet in any European society and you'll see that they're a group of elites coming from uh, financial or industrial sources. Essentially the same group of people in government as out of it. Now something that the regime requires is this myth of human rights. Like currency or interest rates, human rights are weapons. They're rhetorical cudgels used to bring rogue states in line with the empire. The American and European fundamental doctrine of human rights is a framework for free trade. At least it's a foundation for free trade. The American Convention on Human Rights in 1969 and has a European counterpart. Um, but of course, the European version stresses the rights of migrant workers to a great extent. Migrant workers, this invasion, of course, has been organized. It's The invasion is for several purposes. Number one, to destroy European nationhood, which, of course, could be the grounds of real national-based rebellion. Two, to lower wages beyond belief. Three, to destroy unionization. Four, to have a reserve army to use against whites. And five, to sow distrust. There can't even be communication among citizens now. Dealing with these community, so-called communities are such that all they need to do is complain about discrimination and the debate is over. There is not a common language. There's not a common understanding. And when you have this flux and volatility, corporate elites then create their own order. So the European Convention of Human Rights is centered, and this is, this is much older than the, the migrant crisis, but migrant labor is absolutely essential to it. When I studied... You know, Donald Trump first declared his candidacy and made the immigration issue important. It was corporate America, starting by starting with Sears and Roebuck, um, that revolted against him. This all the assaults on Donald Trump comes from one thing that he wanted to slightly limit the dependency of American capital on immigrant and illegal labor. And I had no idea. I had to research this myself. 
to realize just how dependent capitalism is on illegal immigration. Illegal immigration can, you know, suppresses wages because you don't have to pay them even a minimum wage. You could hold deportation over their heads. You can't, they can't unionize. They can't say much of anything. We've dealt with the, um, the Jewish, uh, Orthodox Jewish slaughterhouse in, in Postville, Iowa on this show. It's simply a miniature version of what's going on. They brought in third world labor from all over the place and treated them like slaves. They had nowhere else to go. They had no complaint. Um, now, interestingly enough, the American Convention says this in Article 19. I'm sorry, Article 21. It says, Usury and any other form of exploitation of man by man can be prohibited by law. It's a clear condemnation of rents because usury is just another form of rent-seeking behavior. There's no mention of usury in any other of the human rights documents considered um, in the literature in this field. But of course, that's largely ignored. The concept of rent is the use of external coercion to extract resources from someone. It's anything above and beyond the market price. It could be desperation is usually the big one. Um, someone is accused of a crime and runs to a lawyer. The lawyer to defend him will charge him anything because he'll pay anything to get out of trouble. That's a rent. Use is just simply one, one example. Um, section 18 of the European uh, Human Rights Document the right of their nationals to leave the country to engage in gainful occupation in the territories of other parties there are three entire sections of the European document to the right of migrant workers a huge chunk of it suggests that this is really this is 1950 we're talking about here um that this notion of the migrant invasion has long since been planned. Uh, feminism, integration, everything else is about repressing wages. I have a paper out where I quote many feminist writers saying that they recognize that feminism is about um, pouring women into the into the workplace so as to repress wages and to create distrust, to create a massive um, redistribution of income we talked about on this show before. The notion of dependency of Western capital on illegal migrant labor is intense. So this is why corporate America was screaming the minute Donald Trump, A, declared his, his candidacy, B, was going to be self-financing, and C, made immigration his important one of his important planks, and of course, op- op- opposition to the international trade deal. that even slightly opposing illegal immigration will destroy a political career. Um, Now, what happens is you have this constant volatility in markets. You have to have retraining. Vocational training is important because sectors of the economy are being destroyed and recreated on a regular basis. So these so-called human rights... um, give subsidies to to retrain workers. So in one field, you know, is that's 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 sent off to the third world, that field dies, like textiles or something like that. They need to be retrained. This becomes a human right all of a sudden. Well it's just in the interest of capital. When you understand the level of, of labor productivity over the last fifty years and how little of that actually goes to the, to the worker, you realize the problem here. It is usury, rent-seeking, in its most extreme. And these legal documents protect that. That's the point of it. Um, you know, the concept is, when you have, you know, 300, 400, 500% increases in labor productivity over even just a decade, with maybe a 2% increase in wages, well, where did that surplus value go? Now, of course, the 1950 European document of human rights says, of course, that domestic laws need to be in conformity with these treaties. Part of the European Union's whole concept is to make sure that these ideas become national law. 
The way that liberalism seeks to rule is using the international bodies to circumvent the normal uh, democratic process, such as it is. Liberalism can never come into power honestly. It either comes through the barrel of a gun, like the French Revolution. It comes uh, sneaking in, uh, like the VAWA Law, Violence Against Women Act, which is enshrined feminist ideology as the law of the land, by making it a small part of a much larger crime bill that was almost never debated. But it in of itself, of course, would never have passed. But in disguising it, uh, they were able to ram it through. And of course, using international treaties. Using international treaties that the average person knows nothing about. But the American document, Article 23, the laws of the country must conform to these treaties. So political freedom has to exclude political parties that reject the provisions of these treaties. When the U.S. takes over a country, it bans nationalist political parties. There's a good reason for this. You can't adopt these treaties, having them as a law of the land, that have political parties that want to destroy them. And this is why the right wing is in, mostly, in Europe is mostly in jail. This is why um, right wing opinion has been uh, thrown off the internet. The internet has been a godsend to those who are fighting this new world order. We're talking about a, an extreme level of exploitation um, that Marxists claim to care about, but of course don't, because their systems uh, increase exploitation and enrich the dictators of these countries. Nationalism is, is far more serious about it, because you can't have a non-exploitative system without community, but community has to be based on unity of language, has to be based on, on having a homogenous society. In America, all a, a, a non-white has to do is claim some sort of a um, you know, discrimination or something like that, and the entire organization is brought to its knees. You can't trust anything. You have, for example, amongst journalists, this is a, a, a profession that's drying up. There are very few good jobs left, therefore those who have those jobs will do anything to hold on to them. That means they're extremely easy to manipulate. This is why they do what they're told. Um... Now, in all these documents, all these you know human rights treaties that, that serve as the basis, post-World War II basis of free trade, and of course, political sovereignty is not mentioned. Um, if domestic law has to follow these treaties, then that aspect of, of democratic rule is abrogated entirely. What's happening in Europe shows democracy at its best where nations in Poland and Hungary and Italy have simply had enough with this invasion. They know who it benefits. They know who's behind it. And the regime has absolutely gone insane. Now, I've spoken on this show before about, um, you know, where the uh, the Italians had forced a, um, a caravan of, 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 well, a flotilla off its shores of these organized migrants. Well, they did it to go to Spain. Well, if there's freedom of movement within EU countries, they could get into Italy that way. That's the whole point. You can completely circumvent these national priorities, which is the whole point of the EU. This is a notion of capitalism completely outgrowing the state and seeking to replace it with international bodies that they control and that they create. Capitalism and free trade, and if you take anything here, the creation of the state in the 19th century was a state that paid for the building of canals, a merchant fleet, the first rail systems, acres of land that used to belong to peasants were given to the oligarchs for free. The libertarian idea that there's a, a free market and then there's a government and they're at war with one another is utter garbage. That might be true at the local level. But local entrepreneurship is also drying up, since there simply is no credit. Entrepreneurship, unless it's run by women who have tax breaks and subsidies, uh, is non-existent. Economies of scale is going to rule everything when you have a massive depression that there is simply no way for the West to get out of. So let's use an example, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. Now, I said this when this first happened. 
I said, wait a minute. You have banks who bought and sold debt. You have banks that made a massive profit off the repayment and the interest of these debts. Then they were able to take um, the assets that were that they were leveraged to get, you know, homes and everything else, massive super profits. And now, even more than that, since that they're in trouble, they're now demanding the state give them taxpayer money. So at four levels, the citizen is exploited. And the inspector general, uh, Neil uh, Borowski, obviously he's Jewish, was in contact with Goldman Sachs and everyone else who created this TARP program, has now turned against it, realizing that this, this, this will create a backlash. Unfortunately, it never did. And I said at the time, in 2007, 2008, that if this doesn't create a serious revolution, secession or whatever it is, then we know that the American body politic is dead. The average estimate of the bailout, however, that includes guarantees, hovers between 10 and $17 trillion at all levels. And this is just the U.S. Goldman Sachs makes a big deal of it, claiming that they have repaid some of this money. Um, all they really mean to say is that they took taxpayer money, gambled, made a profit, and paid their taxes. That's not repayment. But the net outlay of the state, just the U.S., to bail out the banks was over $3 trillion, even after their so-called repayment. Now, these guarantees, which is almost over $10 trillion, these federal guarantees of bailouts in the future. Now, why, how this wasn't the, the number one issue in people's minds, including our own people, is a mystery to me. It is, it is beyond exploitation. It's super exploitation. You know, when you sign for a, a credit card, your signature is worth money. It's automatically then borrowed against or sold. So what you have is not a credit card, but a debit card. No money is, it changes hands here. The value is in your own signature. And these are being overvalued prior to 2008 anyway. So then if you pay the principal back, you're giving them far more than they ever gave you. In fact, they've given you nothing. You've given them. You know, using a credit card actually goes into their asset column, not just their their uh, their debt column. Because your signature is worth money. This is what the bond market is. And if you have good credit, your debt may be worth 80% of the coupon value. So what are you paying the principal on? You're paying the principal um, far above and beyond anything that that the credit card company, the bank, has ever ever given. And they've given very little. Then, of course, you have interest on top of that. Then, in many cases, they could repossess the object, the homes or whatever it is. And if that's not enough, the bailout. So four times the average person is exploited and destroyed by these institutions. And this is justified by the so-called free market ideology. Paul Craig Roberts, again, one of my favorite writers here, he says that there's been a redistribution of power in the U.S. from government to private industry. The U.S. is now an oligarchy of private interests. The most powerful ones, Wall Street, APAC, military security complex, oil industry, agribusiness, insurance, and pharmaceutical. These private interests control economic and foreign policy, write the legislation that Congress passes and the President signs, and have achieved the monopolization of U.S. economy by large-scale commercial organizations. As far as I can tell, traditional conservatives scarcely exist in the U.S. today. They've been eliminated by the neoconservatives, essentially militarists committed to U.S. world hegemony. Now, Paul Craig Roberts used to be the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury under Reagan. He has a certain insight that has to be taken seriously here. Of course, I mean, just beyond debate, the U.S. is an oligarchy. But the state is almost entirely privatized. That laws are written by the corporations that are supposed to um, regulate. Um, again, the state and capital, these are not separate entities. The Constitution was written at a time with this mass media empire, these pharmaceutical 
uh, uh, conglomerates were even ever even understood. Corporations are fictitious citizens. Despite their almost overwhelming power, they're protected by the Constitution, as if a, a, a conglomerate and you are equal legally. And they're not. People continue to believe that electing the right people to Congress is going to solve the problem. I mean, this is how stupid it's, it's, it's become. Not realizing that it simply doesn't make any difference. The state is largely a private entity. Politicians have minimal power. And the state couldn't function without becoming a privatized uh, arm of corporate capital. So when all the prior power in a society is private, the Constitution becomes irrelevant. Because it only governs state actions. It is a totalitarian system because there is no aspect of human life in the West that isn't mediated by corporations. So the fraud of free trade, the New World Order, comes down to the fact that governments and international bodies are privatized entities and corporations, protected by the Constitution, rule without limit. In other words, capital and state are not opponents, they're not even distinctive. The concept remains the essence of free trade, the essence of, of modern capitalism is to socialize loss and privatize gain. And this is where we stand. This is the foundation of what's happening today. This is the foundation of the New World Order. These are the illusions it's based on. It's not based on production. It's not even based on money. Because this money is largely uh, uh, entries in a, in, a, in a computer ledger. And certainly not gold or anything like that. It is sheer fantasy. It's, it's purely an image. It's the shadows in the cave wall. And of course, you also have governments, Russia, China, in particular, where the state actually does function as a, as an arm of the nation rather than as an arm of capital. And this is why war has been declared on them. The point I've been trying to make here is the New World Order is Antichrist. It is, it is the end times. It is the internationalization of illusion, the counterfeit reality that Lucifer Prometheus set has put in front of people. The television, uh, the screen is able to replace reality. And language is actually reflecting this fake reality, meaning that human beings are, by many steps, removed from the natural order. The crisis is, is a severe one. Politics is not the answer. However, the only good news is that the regime will collapse under its own weight. The question is, are we capable of properly responding when that happens? Thank you for listening, everyone. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.